Hello, welcome to Humanities 140, Critical Thinking in the Ma Modern Age. In this presentation, we'll be going over Chapter 11, Do Statistics Lie? So before we actually move into statistics and their truthfulness, let's actually define it. Statistics are evidence expressed as numbers. However, it is very easy to manipulate statistics, so it is vital to understand the difference between a good statistic and a bad statistic. So the first thing we need to do is identify how the statistics were obtained. And this is absolutely the most vital part. So we need to know, were the statistics estimated or based on hard numbers? Now, even if something is estimated, it is not necessarily going to be invalid. Some data is hard to compile because people won't necessarily be honest. So researchers will estimate the information based on reasonable parameters. So on the right hand side here, you see a chart. It is put out by the Kaiser family. And you'll see the little um, emblem on the bottom right and the chart itself is the number of women and girls estimated to be living with HIV and these are the top 10 states in the year ending 2010 and you'll see New York, Florida, Texas, California, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina and Illinois now what the important thing is is at the very bottom in the small type the notes data are estimates for adults and adolescents age 13 and older in all 50 states the district of columbia and puerto rico the source and this is the most important part is the cdc national center for hiv aids viral hepatitis stds and tb prevention the CDC is the Center for Disease Control in the United States and their job is to compile statistics on things like HIV, hepatitis, sexually transmitted um, diseases, and tuberculosis. So based on the source, we can feel fairly good about trusting the statistics that are in this particular chart. If the source was not listed, that would be a reason to doubt the chart. So to be, you know, kind of a little bit repetitive, you got to look for the source. The numbers are almost irrelevant unless you can verify and validate the source. If an estimated statistic is using reasonable and comprehensive parameters, they are very useful and informative. If an estimated statistic does not declare itself estimated, then that alone is a reason to question it. So here are some charts, the cancer incidence and mortality in the United States. So these are the diagnoses and these are the actual deaths. And look down here where the arrow is, you'll see estimated numbers from the American Cancer Society in 2008. So these charts come from a society dedicated to identifying and curing cancer. So again, these are the type of organizations that can be very, very well trusted. If there is an organization that um, is sourcing this information and you haven't heard of that organization you should look them up and see if they are valid you know a lot of times um, anybody can make a chart anyone can make a chart and put a name or a source on the bottom of it and if that source is you know John J Jingleheimer Schmidt incorporated but that doesn't exist then you know that chart is completely invalid. So now we're going to talk about the word average. 
because we use it all the time and we don't really think about the intention behind it but in research there is very specific ways of defining average and they are divided into mean median and mode the mean the one that we most associate with the word average is we add up all the values and divide by the total number of values median is determined by listing all of the numbers from highest to lowest and finding the one in the middle. Then we have mode. The mode is determined by counting the frequency of different values and then finding the value that appears most frequently. I have examples on the next set of slides so don't worry if it seems a little confusing. Okay so let's go over an example of the mean. So let's say you take seven quizzes in a class and your scores are 78, 86, 67, 89, 94, 78, and 80. You add up those seven quiz results and you should get 572. The mean is derived by taking 572 and dividing it by seven because you took seven quizzes and that would give you 81.7. So rounding up, the mean is 82. The median, again, same set of quizzes, you're gonna list the numbers from highest to lowest, and by looking at the one in the middle, that is the median. So the median here is 80. Finally, the mode, and again, what you want to do is count the frequency of the different values. So again, what you see here is that there is one grade that appears more than once, which is 78. So the mode is 78. So we have our mean is 82, our median is 80, and our mode is 78. As you can see, these three numbers are not the same. So depending on how a particular statistic is coming up with the average, you have to identify if it's a mean, median, or mode. So let's look at how these averages differ. And we're going to use my favorite sport, which is football. And we're going to look at the average salaries. So we are going to look at the mean of football players and now that I'm looking at um, the Philadelphia Eagles mostly because that's my team despite how pathetic they've been in the last few years. I'm still a holdout. So the mean salary is 1.9 million and I got that information from spottrack.com. The median salary is 770,000 meaning if you lined up everybody's salary from the top player to the bottom player the 770 would be right in the middle and then the mode the one that we see most often is 435,000 and that's specifically for the Eagles so that's the one that is paid to the majority of the players so you see a lot of these big big salary players that make 10, 15, 20 million dollars a season, they're the exception. It is for, far more likely that you'll make between f half a million and two million dollars, which is nothing to sneeze at, mind you, but um, it's still a lot of money um, that we would normally expect someone to be making 10 or 15 million. So another factor to consider is range, and this is the gap from the lowest value to the highest value. So again, using football, the Eagles quarterback in this season, 2015, it's Sam Bradford, uh, the man with no knees, will make $13 million in 2015. The lowest paid Philadelphia Eagle will be paid $450,000 and that's a wide receiver. 
So the range is between 450,000 and 13 million, which, if you did a little math, would be $12,550,000 because you're subtracting the 450,000 from the 13 million to come up with the range. Another issue is distribution. And this is how frequently each of the values occurs. So there's only one person on the Eagles that makes 13 million and that is Sam Bradford. There are two players on the Eagles who make 10 million dollars, Byron Maxwell and Jason Peters. There are, however, 12 players on the Eagles who will make approximately a half a million dollars for the season. So the distribution is also a very important aspect when looking at any research. Now, one of the problems with statistics, because it is very easy to lie about statistics, is a concept called bait and switch. People will often try to prove something by using statistics that don't actually prove anything. So for example, theft on subways is way up. 70% of items stolen in a subway are, su are cell phones. Now both statements refer to theft. However, are they related? Mm, not really, because does this mean you have a 70% chance of having your cell phone stolen on the subway? No, it means that if someone is going to steal something on a subway, it's usually your cell phone. Another way that you can be deceived with statistics is called deception by omission. By purposely not mentioning certain facts, statistics can deceive the reader. So, if four out of five dentists, which is 80%, recommend a type of chewing gum, you should ask, well, how many dentists were asked? Five, 50, 500, 5,000? How many would actually recommend that a person not chew gum? And were they asked about a specific gum or was the question phrased to emphasize that it is sugarless? You have to ask yourself what relevant information is missing from this statistic. And the fact of the matter is that of course sugarless gum or sugared gum is not a, such a big deal, but it is the key to critical thinking is to figure out what is missing. Finally, and I'm sure for anyone who spent any amount of time on the internet, this pop-up has appeared somewhere on a website. And this is a book by Kevin Trudeau, who was a big infomercial guy, and it's called The Weight Loss Cure. And if you notice where my little yellow arrow is, there is a statement that says, they, in quotation marks, don't want you to know about. So the question is, who are they and why don't they want me to know about this? Well, they is the court system who has found Trudeau guilty of fraud. And he was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2014 because almost everything he was selling in his infomercials were scams. He was also fined $37 million dollars by the Federal Trade Commission for running infomercial scams. So he's actually taken the fact that he is a fraud and adapted it to his book. So he's omitting the word they and in fact is um, using it to sell more books that really the weight loss cure doesn't work. He basically tells you to get hormone shots and to eat 500 calories a day. Well, anyone who eats 500 calories a day is going to starve and they're going to be hungry and everything he says is just not true. So that finishes this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email or text me and I hope you have a terrific day.